extremely interesting and I hope controversial session. Um, <laughs> I always like it when, when, when things get controversial. These conference sessions can sometimes um, roll over, whereas, whereas I think what we've got here is a, is a very, very juicy topic. Uh, I mean, obviously, at the moment, very much at the top of, of, of everyone's mind are um, mandatory human rights legislation. Um, the EU, Germany, Norway are all considering legislation in this regard. But, but how do we deal with situations when um, the countries themselves pose almost existential threats to particular industries? Um, I mean, the example given um, in the heading for this conference session um, relates to China, what's going on in the northwest of China, potentially affecting as much as 20% of the world's supply of cotton. But that's not the only example. Um, look at what's going on in Myanmar at the moment. Look at the link between um, Bangladeshi factory owners and um, the political structures in that country. How do companies, how should companies start to unpick some of these challenges um, and, and, and how do we move forward? What are the, what are the red lines on human rights and, and what can be done? Um, we're very lucky to have an extremely distinguished panel um, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what they've um, got to say. We have Jasmine O'Connor from Anti-Slavery International. Uh, we have Aruna Kashyap from Human Rights Watch and last but by no means least, John Morrison from the Institute of Human Rights and Business. Um, now, how I want to uh, run this session is I'm going to ask each of the panellists to give um, some opening remarks to sort of set the scene for the session. Uh, and then there's a couple of um, questions that um, I can pose to the panel. Uh, but then we'd like to hear what you in the audience have to say. And you have in the Pathable platform through which you're viewing uh, this uh, session, you, you have a, a chat screen. If you put um, any questions you have into that, and then I can address them to the, to the panel. And obviously, if there's a particular person on the panel, that you uh, particularly like to hear from, um, please feel free to add that as well. So without further ado, um, and in the, the democratic order of the order in which the, the speakers agree, appear on my screen, um, <coughs> which I suppose is the Zoom equivalent of, I'll start at the far end of the panel and work forward. Uh, I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Jasmine from Anti-Slavery International. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to set the scene a little bit uh, around forced labour uh, and the Uyghur Western region of, of China. Um, and, and by, by first, uh, firstly actually saying that Anti-Slavery International is a co-founder, a member of the, the steering committee uh, of the coalition to end forced labour in the Uyghur region. And that's a coalition that's uh, a broad-based coalition made up of Uyghur groups, labour rights groups, investor groups and many others. It's endorsed by over 380 organisations from 40 countries. So it's a, a sort of significant response to the challenge. Um, but forced labour, just the, the big picture, around about $150 billion per year, it is estimated, is the profit of forced labour uh, generally, globally. Um, we've we've been working on these issues for a number of years at Anti Slavery International, as 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 uh, many of you will will well know, and we're aware how difficult it can be to um, get visibility uh, of of global supply chains, to be able to understand and and trace what is happening. Um, but we do know that it's possible. Uh, we know because we've seen uh, so many uh, organisations, you know, take that challenge seriously and make sure that they are doing everything they can to uh, have traceability and eradicate um, any forced labour in their supply chains. Um, and I think we're seeing the same with China. We're, we're, we in the sort of call to action are, are calling for just that. We're calling for action. We're calling for um, companies to uh, pull out of that, that region of China um, and to actually have an enhanced traceability and enhanced due diligence to make sure that cotton isn't getting into their supply chains from the Uyghur region. We know it's difficult and we know that a lot of... Um, you know, posturing and bullying, if you like, from indeed the Chinese uh, government, you know, has caused some companies to, to backtrack. But we are aware that there are many companies that are, are stepping up and have indeed signed the um, the, 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 the sort of call to action to exit that region and to get the enhanced due diligence in their, their supply chains. And I think you know, from our perspective, we, you know, we're looking this week at the, the sort of eighth year anniversary of the Rana Plaza. 
Um, and that was a disaster that everybody said, come on, we must do better. And progress was indeed made. But now we're looking, you know, in the context of the Uyghur uh, population and around 1 to 1 1.8 million in arbitrary mass detention, you know, we, we can't wait for these disasters to say we, we must do better. We do need the right combination of uh, legal, diplomatic, and practical solutions to make sure that forced labour is is eradicated from all our supply chains, which is why really we, uh, you know, at Anti-Slavery International uh, have, have sort of joined with, with other voices to call for a mandatory human rights due diligence, which would mean that um, work has to be done uh, in, in a way that looks at human rights across supply chains and has um, the right kinds of liability uh, for companies that aren't taking those appropriate steps. And I think, you know, a, a few years ago, it might have been just a few INGOs calling for, for the, this sort of teethy um, law to be in place, but now the, the call is, is, is sort of getting wider and, and broader and lots of companies are, are wanting that as well. Uh, and, and indeed, we know that individuals uh, you know, who come to buy products in the shops, they don't want to have to sort of hunt around and try and do an ethics test on every company. They want to know that actually people are, are protected with some laws that have teeth. Um, and I think I'll end by, by saying that, you know, um, it's great to see that ASOS have, have joined that call uh, for mandatory uh, human rights due diligence uh, uh, in the sort of op-ed that, that Nick has written uh, in the Times today. And I, I just hope that, that, you know, across this sector that uh, leadership, you know, continues to, to grow because there is a significant um, need to put in all of those those measures from the legal through to the diplomatic through to the practical in order to to make the sort of uh, horrors of, of China um, begin to to, to shift um, obviously China is is not the only problem and and you know it it, it, it indeed is the, the worst example um, but I think my colleagues John and, and Aruna are going to cover some of that that wider wider picture so thanks. I like your sort of Radio Two style link through to the uh, to, to the next. Speaker. That's great. Um, that's fa that's fascinating. I think this raises a lot of questions around kind of traceability, mass balance versus yeah. um, a, a more traceable thing. Also, this idea of why does it keep on backsliding? I mean, I'm old enough to remember the Euro '96 hand stitch football. Yet it all we seem to keep coming back to these agendas repeatedly. And that, an interesting question is why that's the case. Um, so anyway, enough for me. Um, so Aruna, um, in, in the democratic order of you being next on my screen, um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's great to be here at this panel. Um, I'm Aruna Kashi. I've worked with Human Rights Watch as a senior counsel for the Business and Human Rights Division. And Human Rights Watch has done a lot of research um, on a number of different sectors on you know, human rights and global supply chains. And, one of the, and I, I want to kick off by saying that I completely agree with Jasmine. Human Rights Watch is also part of the call to action and the, the coalition uh, in Xinjiang. And one of, the, one of the key things I want to touch on, though, is also the role of um, auditing firms. Because there were at least five auditing firms um, that, that came out publicly saying they will refuse to conduct and they will not conduct uh, social audits in Xinjiang. So it raises the question of, you know, what is the role of auditing firms and should more and more auditing firms also take these kinds of ethical positions about what they will not participate in uh, and recognizing that the situations and the circumstances are so dangerous and extreme that it is not possible to interview workers safely in, in, in places like Xinjiang to ever uh, reliably report that something is free of forced labor, that the conditions don't allow it. So that's that's one sort of big question, you know, do we need to see more auditing firms come out? The second, the second tool is, of course, uh, companies have to voluntarily come out and, you know, sign up to this call to action. But we, I mean, over and over again, we have seen the, the, the political limits of voluntary action. So, you know, what is the legislative impetus here that can drive and force companies towards a particular goal if, if there is reluctance for whatever reason? I mean, backlash against their staff versus backlash from the Chinese government. You know, they, they will give you any number of reasons for why they want, don't want to sign. And, and, and the issue is, 
Well, for far too long, they have been sourcing in places that are risky, and it is time that they faced up to that reality and took some serious action. And that, and, and if they can't do this, then there has to be legislative measures that will, you know, hold companies to account. And one of the measures that have been proposed widely and been actively discussed in places is looking at um, import restrictions on goods uh, coming that are largely produced in forced labor conditions from specific areas and region. And from that perspective, I think uh, we've seen the U.S. use this tool pretty usefully. Uh, we've seen EU sort of broach this topic and it's become, it's going to become a live debate. It's become a live debate in Australia. So I think there are a number of jurisdictions that are actively considering this approach. Um, and it's an approach that, that we have to, we have to push more for. I mean, and think of, you know, the range of abuses that will lend themselves to this kind of an approach. And whether, whether, you know, and what is the length of the suspension, whether there's a chance for a mediation, what is the role of brands, what are brands' roles in, in sort of remediation, because brands have the buying power ultimately, and it goes to John's point, and I think Peter raised this on, on traceability, like what is, what is the issue of, of overall traceability in supply chains, and what are companies doing to make sure and drive that kind of traceability, because they do have the power at the top end of the supply chain. And um, one, one of the other things I want to talk about, in, because we're talking about trade, and how can we use tools governing trade um, and related to trade um, to drive, you know, human rights and global supply chains? I mean, the political reality today is that we're in the middle of a pandemic that is not going to end anytime soon, and that's the sad reality. It's raging every day. We speak there are more COVID cases, over uh, 300,000, um, 3 million deaths. I mean, it's it's a huge number of deaths. And if oversight in ordinary times was difficult, oversight in a time, in a ranging pandemic where civil society freedoms are being curtailed, freedom of restriction, there are, there are restrictions on movement for public health reasons, the, the, the risk of just heightened risks of proper verification are severe, more severe now. And it is in a context where we have to have some, everybody wants to have essential services and good supplies. Nobody wants to see food, clothes, uh, you know, es or essential drugs, everything cut off. So they, you know, they, there has to be an essential supply of goods and services. So there are a category of workers, no matter what happens, will have to show up, will have to show up every day to work, be it in the health sector, be it in essential manufacturing there. And so it ra ra raises a series of occupational health and safety considerations for these workers that the sector, that this sector also has to grapple with pretty actively. And I think we have to, as a movement of, of, of as not just companies, ethical companies, um, activists, labor activists, NGOs, unions come together actively to look at the current debates that are also happening at the World Trade Organization. There is an ongoing debate about what governments can do to unleash the manufacturing power internationally to make sure that vaccines, testing kits, treatments, PPE are reached all over the world. Currently, there's a huge skewed distribution of all these goods only in a handful of countries. A large part of the global south that actually produces and is part of the supply chains of international companies are being left out of the supply of vaccines. And if we want to ensure that workers are kept safe, we have to demand that there is there are measures taken at the WTO. So currently, there's a proposal that is being supported by India and lots of other governments, including you know, low-income governments, uh, for a TRIPS waiver. And I think companies in the garment industry, uh, labor rights activists, unions, NGOs also have to publicly say that if we want to move past this pandemic and ensure, and through the pandemic, have essential services produced and have workers show up, that they have to be safe and receive all of these medications and vaccines as in as short a time as possible. The, the fourth thing that I, I do want to touch touch on briefly, I and mean, there are two other measures, and, and Jasmine already spoke about, um, you know, mandatory human rights due diligence and what it means for companies. Like, we have a growing number of companies also pushing for these legislations in different countries. They're actively being considered now in the EU. That are, there's a very strong proposal on the table. We're waiting for a draft to emerge from the European Commission. And I think we, we want a set of principles to, to be embedded in these, in these laws for, for them to actually have teeth. And one of that is 
you know, what does a liability regime look like? I mean, there has to be incentives and disincentives. We have to create a level playing field amongst companies. And we can't have only a small handful of companies, you know, sort of leading the way and the rest of the industry lagging behind without doing anything uh, because you're left to their own voluntary devices. I mean, that, that's, that's not a state of play that's been driving ethical change for a long time. So in that scenario, the, the other parallel tool to use is free trade agreements. And what are the labor protections that are being embedded into free trade agreements? Um, and how are these being implemented? And what is the role of ethical investors in actually monitoring it? So for example, in a lot of the free trade agreements, and if you look at trade patterns, a lot of big companies want to invest and source from special economic zones. And, 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 and countries want to, want, want to keep these places competitive and actually relax a lot of labor protections. And if we look at what kind of protections are needed in special economic zones, I think investors will also start to track what investments actually fall to special economic zones. How many factories are in these special economic zones? How many factories are actually outside and what are the protections? And coming back to Peter's point on Bangladesh, I mean, we have seen, for example, the Bangladesh Accord being one of those sort of low, like, you know, almost alone in, in the tower of the example it's set in terms of an enforceable binding agreement with transparency, with responsible exits, with escalation, pooling resources, cutting audit fatigue. It did a lot of things. And how can how can this industry, at the very least, replicate this in extreme situations of forced labor where the country situation is permitted by, by bringing different parties together? I think we, we can't expect that this will happen in every single country on every issue, but I think we can expect that there are a smart mix of tools and companies should know that it's in their interest to pool resources and sign up to enforceable binding agreements because it also protects workers while also protecting the company from it, from the risks um, to invest to its own investment. Um, so I, I would, you know, those are the main things I would touch on. Thank you. There's a whole conference on any one of those four points you made. Um, really, really, and I, mean, I think particularly the point you make about COVID, I think it's one of those, uh, you sit in the UK, um, you've seen the, the issue of people who have been obliged to go to work rather than the likes of us who can quite happily sit in jolly comfortable studies um, rather than having to actually go and interact with people. Uh, but I think maybe that also prompts a question about what other unseen dangers like that lie in supply chains that haven't been looked at. You look at look, most rural supply chains, you look at something like coffee in DRC, it's women who, who carry the crops around the place, but yet you've got armed groups. What's the implication of that for, for gender-based violence, et cetera, et cetera? Also, we your comment about free trade agreements and, and special economic zones, I think is fascinating because, again, they're often presented as being a good thing, whereas the point you make about sometimes maybe they're relaxing labor regimes too much, but there is also the wider question. There's a lot of evidence that special economic zones often add, fail to add any additional value added to, to local companies you know, jobs for local people. So, you know, there's an interesting sort of set of issues there. Um, Oliver, note, let's have a conference session about that next time around. Um, so fascinating points. And uh, last, but as I say, by no means least, John, over to you. Yes, and just on that final point, Peter, I mean, I mean, it might not offer jobs to local people, but sometimes to migrant workers. I mean, we can come on. Um, having visited a number of special economic zones in different parts of the world, it's it's complex. I, I want to be a bit counterintuitive because I agree with everything that Jasmine and Aruna have said, and it'd be really boring if I just agree. So I'm going to be a little counterintuitive if I can to spice it up a bit. Um, of course, mandatory human rights due diligence. Of course. I mean, but the devil's in the detail. Um, if you look at the French example, the, the, the recent report by L'Entreprise Paul Edouard Delon show, there's, show the, the danger that the, the French model it has turned into a tick-boxing exercise for most French companies. So I hope um, both in terms of the European Union but also in the UK that board oversight and board involvement in the, in the mandatory due diligence process is, is a, is a pre-requirement. And the Rio Tinto example um, in Australia is an example of why that's important, I'd say. Um, so, and I'd also, you know, in, con in context of auditing not being safe, uh, China, Myanmar, etc. Again, due diligence only takes you so far. And I think a lot of the challenges about this conversation are actually strategic and systemic. And therefore, due diligence is, is only not really the right tool to answer some of those bigger questions. So the second point on trade, and as you've said already, Peter, 
you know, cotton, you know, BTI is based on a, on a mass balance equation. Most uh, manufacturers will buy in cotton from the global market. Most countries will sell their cotton to the global market. So if we really want to use um, the, the, the cotton trade as a leverage point, it raises this issue of, of whether we need to be moving away from mass balance trading relationships. And that's a big deal because most commodities are sold onto the global market and bought off the global market. And there are technical and financial and I would say even developmental aspects as to why that's a good thing. But I'm also very familiar with, you know, uh, commodities that, that have been siloed off from that. So that I think is the big question, whether it be state sponsored forced labor in China or Turkmenistan or child labor and forced labor in cotton supply chains in Africa and India, they're not state sponsored, but are still there. Um, the next point is sanctions and tariffs. Uh, Magnitsky sanctions are clearly a good thing. Um, but of course, when you think about the apparel sector, and I'll give the example of Myanmar now because of our uh, role with, with the Myanmar Center for Responsible Business, the generals don't really own the apparel sector in, 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 in Myanmar. I, I think there is some evidence that some of the export zones are that, that they do, uh, the military has some interest in terms of the land. But it's not like beer or um, hotels or you know some of the sectors where the military has huge economic concerns. Um, there are 600,000 women, mainly women, employed in the apparel sector now in Myanmar. Um, most of these women up until 10 years ago were needing to migrate to uh, or get trafficked to Malaysia to work. So the issue is what would it mean to remove GSP tariff um, uh, requirement um, um, uh, uh, relief from Myanmar. And, and this is the debate we were having two or three years ago after the genocide. In Rakhine State, it's a, it's a debate we're having again now because of the military coup. Um, let's make sure our tariffs, our trade-related sanctions are targeted and go after the people that we should be going after and not the workers. Um, I, I personally don't think it would be a good thing for Myanmar if H&M and others pull out. Uh, because what will happen to these women? And, 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 I, and I hope <laughs> someone can answer that question. Um, the final point I'd like to make is th this, you know, this issue of human rights leverage. You know, is, is human rights an issue of solidarity and symbolism, or is it, as we would say through the, UN, the UNGPs or the OECD guidelines, an issue of leverage and changing behaviour? And therefore, we really have to challenge ourselves, to, I think, to think, where is the leverage in the apparel sector? And the thing I keep coming back to, as well as all the problems we've just gone through, is the apparel sector is a low-wage sector built in large part on low wages. And countries compete with each other around the world to be in the supply chains of major brands because they offer a low-wage culture to the global marketplace. Now, I know we've moved on a bit from there, um, and I'm actually arguing against myself in, in saying that brands should stick for the long course. But the issue of living wage in the global supply chains, I think, remains the big issue um, and still remains in terms of human rights, politics and the apparel sector is why are so few brands and apparel supply chains premised on, on a living wage ethos. And, and I'll stop there, Peter. Thanks. Thanks, John. Again, some... Um some some fascinating remarks and i think the this sort of how to move the tick box and maybe that's where i'd like to sort of take the discussion now is there's always a risk and we've seen this all the way through from you know when we had csl all the way through to where we are now but companies that, that get it get it and will actually do the work to actually really go and explore what what the challenges are whereas others will will set up uh you know to pit parts of their company secretariat to, to make sure they can tick the boxes most effectively, um, how how do we actually ensure that things like, for example, the the the, the, the due diligence uh, legislation the EU is considering? How do we actually make sure that it, or rather, what steps can we take to support companies in actually making that work on the ground? I mean, if you look at um, um, sort of smallholder farming, there's a risk that, um, for example, environmental regulations within that, and the same is true on on living wage issues as well, might militate towards companies dealing with large-scale um, commercial farming because small-scale farmers are much more problematic. So actually you could end up 
with the problem being exacerbated because you end up with the small scale the small scale farmers excluded there's a risk that you could have the same thing happen in in the apparel sector um so how do we avoid the fact that um a good idea or or or, or a valuable well-intentioned idea could actually end up having the wrong impact on the ground how do we because doesn't that mean that you've got to actually get people to start to engage with the complexity of the problem whereas actually the blokes back at hq just want to sort of say right problem tick done how do we go about doing that i mean um who, who, who'd like to come in first on that jasmine you've been nodding most vociferously so yeah I'll, I'll... I'm, I'm very happy to, to to comment on that i mean i think the, the the very first thing that needs to happen is that the these laws need to be um, informed through consultation by those individuals who are most affected, you know, i.e. workers and communities in producer countries. I mean, that's that's first and foremost, because when we make legislation, you know, we, we as you say, have to be thinking about the, um, you know, the end result of that legislation and exactly how it will impact, uh, you know, people on, on the ground, as it were. Um, you know, we're, we're also arguing for those laws to, to, to make sure that they apply uh, to sort of the whole operations, so the entire business chain um, and, and across um, different uh, sectors uh, and, and industries so that there's a, a holistic response. But I think the, the, you know, to go to the question of how do you then implement that in a way that, um, you know, mitigates uh, any kind of um, unintended consequences. I think the argument that I would come up with is, is that it again, has to be done in consultation uh, with people in those localities. It has to sit within, um, you know, uh, looking at the wider um, socioeconomic issues of a community, you know, and actually you do get into the business of, of saying, you know, we, we can't be shifting this if we're not also looking at those systemic, uh, those other systemic issues, you know, such as living wage, such as the legislation in different countries, et cetera, et cetera. So I think to say that uh, mandatory human rights due diligence um, is the only answer is, is naive, but it is a part of the uh, systemic uh, solution but it's going to need a lot around it in order to make sure that as it's implemented, it's done in a way um, that obviously doesn't create unintended uh, consequences. And I think to say, you know, in, in different situations, that, cause that's going to mean different things. Because, you know, if we do come back to a, a situation of forced labour, uh, and certainly if we look at, uh, at China and Uyghur people, um, actually... Uh, a result there is to is to stop that forced labour full stop. You know, it, 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 you can't you can't compare. You know, if there isn't, it, it, you know, you, you either stop it or you don't stop it. You can't say, um, you know, we're we're going to sort of worry about the unintended consequences because the existing consequences are are are, are so significant and so uh, egregious. Uh, and I think the final thing to say, I, I suppose, is is looking at the. The, the wider, you know, economic and, um, you know, development context of, of countries and beginning to, um, you know, as I say, sort of campaign and focus on, you know, decent work for all. So it can't, it can't happen outside of that, of that um, framework, I think would be my, my thoughts. Okay. Thanks, Jasmine. John, uh, Aruna, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, Peter, you're right to say that um, increasing uh, requirements can favour big companies over small companies and can, can squeeze SMEs out of supply chains, but it doesn't have to. So if you think about post-apartheid South Africa, if you think about what Unilever has done with its own uh, living wage and supply chain requirements with its 2 billion euros a year investment into um, um, black and minority owned SMEs, etc. You know, there are things that companies can do to offset the risk of um, homogenization in global supply chains. I think there's also, I mean, I've been to, <laughs> well, uh, up until a year ago, I was going to lots of the discussions around blockchains and supply chain and, and, and trying to get my head around what would blockchain be a net? Does it actually offer anything for traceability? And if it does, is it a net good or a net bad? Um, but I think there are some people out there who are thinking quite openly about 
technology technological approaches to traceability that are going to be accessible to to farmers even at the low end of the scale it doesn't have to be if things are open source and low cost that that these requirements have to be expensive both in terms of time and money we can find elegant ways i think of improving traceability um, and rewarding i mean i think the issue is also rewards let's make sure that suppliers that do perform well on these issues or outperform are rewarded financially by the buyers and by the consumers for doing so and i think Peter, I, we don't talk enough about this. There's a la there's a lack of rewards in the current structure, I think, for for, for good performance. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, I you know, on this traceability thing, I mean, um, I can't ask her to speak because the way the thing's set up. But I know um, Cotton Connective have done a lot of work on on traceability of cotton, which I think is something that could be applied also to uh, to other um, to other commodities as well. But I think sometimes the the challenge is the complexity of doing it. Um, you know, it's 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 sometimes easier to sort of go for a mass balance approach where you can again it's the it's the tick box approach um which is not very not very helpful as you say john if if, if there are models like cotton connect out there which demonstrates that it can be different and i guess the question is how do we build on how do we build on those um just one other thing i'd like to pick up on before i come to a couple of questions from the from the floor is it was a point uh you made um jasmine and aruna you also made the same sort of comment you called it jasmine legal diplomatic political um, often it seems to me that problems which are systemic in some of these countries end up kind of being blamed on global supply chains, whereas in actual fact the global supply chain is the thing that is the lens through which we see them rather than the problem itself. Uh, you know, you look at something like, again, I'm, I'm wandering off into soft commodities, but, you know, the problem of, 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 of child labour in cocoa in West Africa is not a cocoa problem, it's a, a West Africa societal problem. Um, so how how might we be able to create a sort of triangulation that means that what we're increasingly obliging companies to do is better joined up with with sort of legal and diplomatic approaches? Um, because otherwise, there's a there's always a thing that we there's always a sense that we're trying to whip some of these countries with the multinational company stick rather than having a more joined up approach. As you raise the point, Jasmine, I'll come to you first on that. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think, you know, I think that there are many, many ways we can do it. And I mean, picking up on, on John's point, there, there's got to be a re reward and there's got to be some incentives built into um, doing the right thing. But I think when I'm looking at the um, sort of legal, diplomatic and, and political, uh, you know, I'm recognising that, yes, on the one hand, we want mandatory human rights um, due diligence. But on the other hand, we need laws in countries that protect people's basic human rights, uh, full stop, you know, um, and sort of moving on the, the, the political and civil human rights. So, you know, I, I come from a, a sort of background where I, I've worked for, for what is now the FCDO, you know, and I think we can't be looking at solutions that don't actually look at the right kind of diplomatic um, relations that look at you know trading in and 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 workers rights uh, having at the heart of them the kind of, of standards that we would we would want to see in our supply chains and i think you know i do think corporates um have got a role to play there um i mean we've certainly been involved with um uh, models where companies have had conversations with governments and companies have have explained you know we would like to set up in this country um but we've got concerns about x y and z and actually creating support uh, for change in in some of those those contexts and i think when you look then you know at the the, the sort of political challenges and the political um levers in in relation to that it's obviously a you know a multifaceted uh, and multi-challenged uh, problem, but I think we you know we do have to so coming back to John's point, we do have to um, you know consider the use of some of those uh, Magnitsky type sanctions on sort of political uh, characters that are, are sometimes driving the the wrong solutions. So I think it is about looking you know uh, and and having yes these big set pieces like MHRDD, but then looking Looking on a country by country basis and saying, you know, what other what other levers that, that that can be that can be pulled, and how can we as civil society, you know, work with governments and work with business to to, to pull those levers and and to start to um, see things 
see things change in, in a systemic way, uh, both internationally, but also on a country by country and regional basis. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, Aruna, do you want to come in on that one? Yes, I mean, I actually have a slightly, uh, you know, coming back to your point about, you know, is this, is this going to be easier for big companies and more difficult for SMEs? And is this mandatory human rights due diligence going to be like a stick and a stick on who? I mean, I have a slightly, you know, different take. I think it's the problem today is that the bigger companies and going back to John's point about, you know, living wage being an issue that's that's one of the longest standing issues that doesn't seem to have a solution. And, and, the, and the real problem is we have companies with a lot of clout um, ordering and sourcing from countries, insisting on a level of labor compliance, and rightly so, but driving down the prices. You see, so it, the, the two don't go together. I mean, I've spoken to suppliers who say, you know, brands are not even willing to pay the increase in a minimum wage. Absolutely. The minimum wage is nowhere close to a living wage level. So as long as that happens, we will never see change in global supply chains. And the reason why these mandatory human rights due diligence laws give some hope is because they will hold the brands accountable for how they treat the smaller people with lesser power in the supply chain. For example, Peter, to your point about are we going to go into, is, is this going to root out really small farms and small factories? A lot of the subcontracting and, you know, this entire sort of industry that's hidden happens because of the unfair buying practices of, of big companies. And I think if we sort of cut it there with, with mandatory human rights due diligence, asking companies what they've done about their own buying practices and holding them to account, I think it will drive change and it will drive change to truly empower even smaller suppliers. And we do, I agree with everybody here, that we need to think of a system of not just disincentives, but incentives and disincentives um, for companies that do it well and don't do anything. Thank you, very, thank you for that. I mean, um, I'll now do a shameless plug. Um, and as a chair, I can. Um, on the back of what we've been doing in smallholders, we're developing something that we're calling the Sustainable Commodities Marketplace um, to really address some of the issues that, that, that we've been talking about. How do you put more power into the hands of smallholder farmers, but also how do you get to the stage where you can actually have much more traceability of what's going on? Um, uh, so anyway, end of shameless plug. Anyone that wants to know more, um, I, can send the, I can send the info. Um, Interesting question um, from Paula in the in the audience, Paula Rogers, um, talking about the fact that in uh, m many of the countries, but the origin countries we're talking about, the vast proportion of people work in the informal sector. Um, how do we address the issues there? That you know, again, it's in a sense it's easier if you're going to order the factory. I mean, okay issues in China aside, because at least it's a it's a manageable space. Um, what do we do about those in the informal sector, which is, you know, in most developing economies, at least 90% of the economy. Um, John, do you want to start on that one? Super hard question, of course. Um, That's why I gave it to you first. And one, you know, one of the, the positives about China, we're talking about the negatives now, but, but up until about seven or eight years ago, we, we would say perhaps that, you know, China had had taken steps to, to try and close down the informal sector or better regulate the informal sector. Um, of course, the problem in China is the opposite now. It's over control, it's state intervention into the marketplace um, for state sponsored forced labor. So, you know, it's almost the opposite, right? Um, but it, as you say, in many developing countries, the informal sector is the normal. And we listen, I, I, it, it, it's a big question. It is about the political will of national governments, particularly in democracies, because, you know, they have agency, people vote for governments. Um, those governments need to uh, ratify uh, all the ILO conventions and they need to have systems of enforcement and labour inspectors um, uh, that will walk into the informal sector as well as the formal sector. But until we get there, um, I do think, you know, commitments from companies, I would say Unilever again, because I know they're not an apparel company, but this idea of driving the living wage through a supply chain. For me, mandatory due diligence is important, but for this sector, this is even more important because if, if you do drive behavioural change through your supply chain, um, right through that supply chain, and remember the informal sector doesn't just provide commodities, 
Um, one of the big risks around the informal sector are, are labour providers, providing labour and moving workers within countries and across borders. Um, and, and a lot of the forced labour risk is in the movements of people um, in the informal sector, not, not, not just the, the work done or, the, or around particular products. Um, um, a lot can be done by the bigger companies really driving this through all the steps of the supply chain and until it reaches the informal sector. Um, that's the short term. The long term is, is much better regulation and enforcement at national level by, by government. Trying to make sure I got, couldn't find my unmute, unmute button. Um, Aruna, Jasmine, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I just have to heart, I mean, the one part of it that I have to just heartily agree, which is I think living wages, driving living wages through the supply chain is, will be like one of the biggest issues to look for uh, going forward and what companies are going to do differently to do it. And, you know, the mandatory human rights due diligence piece can at best ask companies that question, you know, have you assessed the risk of your, posed by your own buying practices for labor, labor rights in your supply chain and what does it mean? Because... I mean, going back to some of the some of my discussions with workers, uh, suppliers, I think I mean every uh, there are a lot of instances where, for example, where a supplier has gotten daily wage workers to come in to do an extra order. Suddenly, you know, there there are like ten days of of seasonal daily wage workers who suddenly start to come when there is a rush of orders because the buyer hasn't given proper specifications has changed their you know purchase order has done something different to it that's that's putting this pressure and doesn't give the right deadlines or timelines for the, the producer to deliver so you know it's it's a complex issue we can't put all our eggs in one basket which is of course there has to be mandatory due diligence but i think we also need to work with investors to hold companies where where there are investors who can hold companies accountable and drive them and there are some very interesting investor-led initiatives on living wages and I think looking to those initiatives will also be a very interesting way of driving this piece. And, and yes, it's a more complex argument on how, what, what kind of regulatory model do we want to see govern home-based workers, for example? And what is a company going to do if they detect home-based workers? Because a lot of the big companies want to walk away. They, you know, as, as long as they don't know home-based workers are in, the, in their supply chain, they seem okay with it. But the moment they realize they're home-based workers, they don't want anything because it, it, it poses a whole series of questions for them about quality issues. They're not so, so concerned about the labor rights piece of it. They're realizing their products are being made in people's homes. So, and, and they want to walk away from that side. So it's, it's a more complex argument of what are we going to do with an entire set of women, especially because a large part of whom these workers are all women workers uh, in global supply chains when they detect because that is an in, you know informalization. Um, and I think regulation is one role, and we and certainly regulatory mechanisms and good good examples being shared amongst countries. Uh, there are some home based reg good legislation, let's say in some countries, and how to implement it will be you know an important piece to work towards. Thanks for that. Um, we've got a question from Katie Fenson, which to some extent picks up on um, the point that one of you is making in your introductory remarks about, about trade deals, free trade deals. Um, Katie is saying, what about WTO rules? Um, and we've talked about the role of, as it were, destination governments in establishing mandatory uh, human rights legislation. Um, but there's an argument for saying that's almost allows governments like ours to sort of pass off responsibility to, to the companies to solve the problem. Um, what perhaps could be done better, be it at the WTO, be it in the structuring of trade deals, to actually mean that government is doing the bit that it can do, which might be around, for example, capacity building of those governments to enforce rules, because often rules are not enforced not because there's corruption or malfeasance intended, but just because there's not the capacity in those governments to do it properly. Um, so how might that work? Where could we, as a, you know, those who wish to make change in this sector, what might we usefully do to bring greater pressure on our governments beyond just ensuring that they put in place due diligence legislation for companies to implement? Jasmine, I'll come to you first on that one. 
So it's a great question and, and a really difficult question um, to answer in a lot of a lot of ways. But I but I okay, you know, I think it's a question we do have to answer. Um, I mean the you know we're, we're we're sort of sitting here in the UK talking about mandatory human rights due diligence while we're running around the world getting whatever trade deals uh, we can. Um, I mean we've certainly as an organisation been engaging. Uh, with some of the sort of consultations uh, around, um, you know, trade and trading arrangements, and and pressing for those trade deals to be um, inclusive of the right sort of uh, standards. But I do think we need significant um, sort of global leadership on this. Um, you know, we're hosting G7 this this year, um, and I think. The, the call has got to go out to say that actually if we are going to build back better we seriously have to look at the rules of the rules of trade and look at the way in which um, deals are, are are made whether that's um, looking at the uh, WTO rules or whether that's looking at um, the the sort of standards that um, you know uh, a sort of bilateral and multilateral, arrangements hold to we we need to we need to look at it and we need to understand it and we need to um argue for for an embedded approach um i mean we all know that um you you can you can sort of talk about the mandate of human rights due diligence on one hand um but then on the other hand completely take it away and undermine it by trade deals that that have no no recognition of, of any kind of human rights uh, within them and so yes good question um, and let's keep that conversation going because um, I do think I do think it is a significant a significant issue. John? Yeah at the, at the WTO level um, I worry now that, that these issues have been weaponized in the China US um, trade struggle um, but always hopeful the, the the Doha round will <laughs> eventually come to be, but I think in the meantime it is bilateral agreements, and I mean it is depressing here in the UK. I mean, did you know, for example, that we signed our agreement with the Cameroon, a country in civil war, on the 9th of March? Um, how, how many British people know that? How you know that it, it was debated in Parliament for an afternoon, I believe. And any human rights due diligence? Has anyone seen the trade agreement? Has anyone read it? Um, this, you know, it, it very much, I'm very disappointed, obviously, uh, that we don't even have those minimal protections that the European Union had and the European Parliament at least had oversight over trade agreements. It seems the British Parliament has scarce oversight at the moment in terms of our trade agreements. So I think, however, however, I think um, probably in the US initially, but then maybe over here eventually, um, there will be a sort of resurgence of human rights and trade protections in, and sorry, worker protections in bilateral agreements because British workers will demand it. Um, and partly it will be linked to the just transition discussions around climate. So they will come, I think. But but the bigger, my bigger worry um, is, is the way that this is weaponized now between the US and China and the fact that we're now moving away, I think, in the next five to 10 years from, from global free trade altogether. But we can come back to that if there's time. <laughs> so unfortunately, we're running out of time. And, and apologies for everyone. The, the way this platform works is it's quite a, an abrupt chuck out um, that you don't get your 10 minutes of finishing your drinks. So um, Aruna, um, comment from you on that? Because I think we've got about a minute and a half left. Yeah, and I just wanted to point to the US Mexico Canada agreement again. They've, they've, you know, they do have a special mechanism to resolve, um, you know, persistent labor problems. There are a series of measures that governments have to take. It's, it brings in greater enforcement. It has been controversial, of course, but it, it has been a better version of, of the previous uh, NAFTA. So I think uh, that that is one model to look at and be look more closely and see and to Joanne's point about we have to pay attention to free trade agreements. We have to look at these bilateral agreements and not take our eyes off of these because they're a very strong parallel. But I also want to say that regardless of whether, like, even in the worst case scenario, that is assuming, you know, free trade agreements didn't get a labor rights chapter or a human rights chapter in it, that, that sort of catered to the, the needs of both, you know, the, the communities in the global south, especially to protect their rights, investors can still track what 
what you know where which countries what uh, the percentage of the company's investments and in sourcing is and what are the countries you know how the a company's supply chain is structured are they chasing after the worst countries with the worst sort of weakest labor legislation and and going to the cheapest markets and expanding or is our and 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 what does an ethical investor want then in that so exactly. that, that's a close parallel to also track uh, the investor piece right uh, Thank you very much. And I, given that we now have run out of time, and just before we get completely cut off, thank you very much to the speakers for some really, really, really interesting discussion. Thank you to the questions from the floor. But um, there's a lot, uh, a lot to pick on here, um, and I think we'll be revisiting these issues again and again. But thank you so much, Jasmine, Aruna, John. Thank you so much for participating, um, and thank you everyone for for coming along. And um, enjoy the rest of your day.